Welcome everyone to another Office Hours. Uh, my name is Purva Ashok. I'm from the Rebus community and I'm joined by uh, my wonderful co-host from the Open Education Network, Karen Lauritsen, and a few other team members from um, the OEN. There's Craig Sandler and Barb Dees on the call. So today's topic is OER course markings. Um, quite an interesting topic for us to be diving into, but I will just say if this is your first time attending Office Hours, know that this is an informal conversation. Um, we will hear from our guests. Um, each of them will take five minutes to present about their topic, share their experiences, um, and then we'll turn things over to all of you for your questions, for your thoughts, and we'll let you drive the conversation following that. Um, if there are future topics that you'd like us to discuss, or if you'd like to be a guest at an office hour session, um, we are always open to your suggestions. I'm going to drop in a link to a form here that you can fill out and share your suggestions or topics. Um, and we definitely keep reviewing this regularly to see if there's something that we've missed that you would like us to dig, dig deeper into. Um, today's lineup is really fantastic. We're going to be talking about um, course markings and how we can make it clearer to students um, and other stakeholders that OER is being used in the classroom and what kind of impact um, this clarity and transparency might have, both to students, um, but also to others in the higher education institution um, or behind, you know, the policy doors. So, Karen, I'll turn it over to you um, to tell folks a little bit about yourself, the OEN, and to introduce our guests. Thank you, Aperva. As always, we are delighted to be here with you and with the Rebus community. The OEN is a community of people who are working to make higher education more open and many OEN members are on this call and like our three guests, we'll probably have lots of stories and resources to share. So uh, we're delighted to welcome three guests who will share um, some case studies with us. First, Sarah Hare, scholarly communication librarian at Indiana University. Then we'll hear from Nathan Smith, instructor and OER coordinator at Houston Community College. And then finally, we'll hear from Ann Fiddler, who's Open Education Librarian at City University of New York. As Aperva mentioned, our three guests will speak briefly, and then we'll really turn it over to you um, for your questions and comments um, about what they share with you uh, today. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Sarah. Great, thanks for that introduction. Um, again, I'm Sarah Hare. I work at Indiana University Bloomington. And uh, we're not actually doing open course marking um, at IU. I'm here to talk a little bit more about a uh, book project that I was sort of a co-editor on. So I'm going to go ahead and put that link in the chat. Um, this was a book that was published last spring. And it's all about course marking and course tagging, both open and affordable course materials. And uh, both Nathan and Anne had case studies in the book. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about it as a resource that might be useful to folks that are kind of considering this um, and thinking about how to operationalize uh, the sort of like big project on their campus. Um, so the book, I, I should say too, the book was supported by Rebus. We're part of their beta project. Um, and we also use Hypothesis and Pressbooks. So the book itself is kind of this like, you know, open experiment in some ways. Um, but the content I think is, is really helpful. So in addition to having uh, multiple case studies from different contexts, uh, you know, that uh, use different SIS uh, student information systems um, and, you know, implement course markings in very different ways based on how they define open, how they define affordable, what kinds of um, sort of icons they're using, that sort of thing. Uh, in addition to those case studies, there's also sort of a deeper dive. So the book is interesting because it's part like case studies, almost like edited book, and then also part collaboratively written monograph in some ways. So, so the first part is more of a monograph sort of deep dive into um, course markings specifically for open and affordable uh, course materials. And so we talk a little bit about um, why you might want to mark, uh, why it's important for student agency and thinking about, um, you know, students being able to get all of the information they need to make an educated choice about which classes uh, to take, how that fits into their own kind of, you know, financial circumstances, um, and transparency around that. Uh, we also, um, the second kind of part we talk about is legislation. So I'm gonna throw this in the chat as well because I think it's so great. Um, 
Nicole Allen led this section um, about legislation and there's a chart like maybe halfway a little bit further down than halfway um, that just does a great job summarizing, for example, what states um, are required to mark courses, what year that legislation was passed, and then what exactly the language says about what kinds of uh, courses or course materials have to be marked if that's defined, you know, so we're really trying to, um, the book is trying to take all of these ideas and kind of organize them and help folks that are sort of jump starting a program. Um, other information in the book, we have a section devoted to stakeholders and talking points. So who are the folks that you want to talk to as you're starting an initiative and what are some um, talking points. So what are some things that might really um, kind of help them uh, think through why this might be a good idea? What are some concerns they would have, right? Uh, for example, a common um, kind of retort we hear from faculty as well, won't this mean that the, the courses that aren't marked OER will get less registration, you know, so, so how do you deal with some of those bigger issues? How do you deal with the cost issue? So just some kind of guidance and um, sort of a framework around that. And then we also uh, dive into uh, the technical pieces. So we have like a kind of system section where we talk about SIS and some of the technical considerations for implementing these changes. Um, and then finally, another section um, sorry, two other sections, one about marketing and messaging, um, and the last one about uh, assessments. So this is, you know, very new. And so I think a lot of the assessment approaches we have are um, sort of introductory or anecdotal. And so we try to, uh, the, the book authors have tried to kind of set up, a, again, a framework or some ideas for like, how could you use both quantitative and qualitative measures to assess any course marking endeavor that you start and really reflecting back on like, what, what are your goals and what kind of metrics might help you um, think about if, you know, those goals were met. So I'll stop, I'll stop talking because I want to be able to have a conversation um, with you all, but I hope that you'll check out the book and I'm here to answer any questions you have about it. Great. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction and overview of what sounds like a really valuable guide. Um, over to you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, inviting me to um, talk a little bit about our course marking um, process at HCC. So it was really interesting to participate in the project and try to draft out a case study that described what we did. Um, you'll find that um, when we went through the process, we were kind of had several stages in thinking about it. And um, that might be useful to you in thinking about sort of what are your goals and priorities in terms of course marking. I think as with any big project like this, you really want to put that at the forefront. You know, what am I trying to accomplish with this? Um, so some of the decisions that we made, key decisions we made were, um, first and foremost, we decided to uh, highlight cost as the feature that we were going to mark for. So we have a zero cost books course mark. We have a low cost books course mark. And the low cost book is a threshold of $40 um, total for uh, new instructional materials purchased at the bookstore. So, um, <clears throat> That decision was made primarily because we felt like cost is the salient factor for students. And we thought that our course marking was, was primarily a student facing uh, project. Um, and so um, <clears throat> there's advantages and disadvantages to this, I think, if, as you may, may think about. So for instance, we can't say with certainty that all of our zero cost books courses are uh, use OER. Most of them do, and in fact, most of our low cost book courses use OER. Um, that's how they get to that low cost, but we can't say for sure that that's the case. Um, the flip side of that is that zero cost and lo low cost are actually fairly easy to measure because you can just look at what is uh, required at the bookstore, you can look at the syllabus. Um, it's fairly simple to sort of uh, identify the courses or verify that the courses are correctly marked. Um, when it's OER, with OER as your marker, that's a little bit diff more difficult because then you really have to go in and look at the resource, make sure that the resource is in fact openly licensed and meets the criteria for an open educational resource. So 
Um, we try to accomplish that through training by uh, just bringing faculty in to learn about what open licensing means and what are the advantages of that for teaching and for um, developing resources. Um, but when, we, when it comes to marking the courses, we focus on the cost. Um, you know, one of the benefits of that, of, of focusing on cost, and um, is that we have been able to kind of ramp up a program pretty quickly so that within you know a year of imp of launching these this tagging we were getting you know uh i mean we're a very large institution so keep that in mind when you look at this but we were getting close to 300 section or 300 sections um a semester for fall semester spring semester by within a year of launching that and then that's gone up um since then so um you know we're when you when you make it kind of simple, I think you can get, get a lot of a lot of quick buy in. Um, but if you want to really focus on open, I think that requires a little bit more of a process. I'll just say um, what we do in order, terms of like communicating with students. I think since that was sort of one of the features that we wanted to focus on today, I'll say that what we do is we have a communication strategy that we've developed with our communications department. So basically at the beginning of every enrollment period, we do a social media blast, which basically, is, it's basically tells students, you know, you could save up to $1,000 on textbooks for the year. That's our tagline. And that's based around the development of what we have a Z degree. So if a student took all of their courses as zero cost courses, um, then they, they can do that at, um, close to eight campuses right now, plus online. Um, if, if they were to do that, then they could save up to about $1,000 a year. Um, we don't have many students who fully enroll in zero cost courses. It's usually like a one or two courses per semester. But anyway, that's the selling point. What we do then is we send them a link, directs them to a landing page. The landing page has some videos that describe how they could search for courses that are tagged because it requires using some filters in the um, in the SIS. And then um, it also has a form that they can enter their information that goes into a back end database that I can pull from and send email messages to them, um, just encouraging them to enroll in those courses. So that's our communication strategy um, right now. And um, <clears throat> I also work, <clears throat> excuse me, once a year, I meet with the advisors and enrollment officers and just they have a sort of big meeting I come in and I just say okay here's here's how you help students search for these things because that's typically the first point of contact for students when they're enrolling for classes they're going to meet with somebody in enrollment or advising so if that person can tell them how to use the search tool and can look for courses that are low cost or zero cost that helps so Awesome. All right, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, it's great to hear about the communication campaign and then what sounds almost like reaching out individually or in groups to students once you've identified those who are interested. So that is uh, our first two guests, and now over to you, Anne. Hi, so thank you also for having me. Um, uh, what Nathan had to say, uh, and we didn't talk before, was very similar to sort of what I was going to say. Um, we do a very similar process. Um, we have something called a, um, uh, we, we mark it as a, an attribute in our system. So if, you, if you're looking for a intensive writing course, that would be considered an attribute. And we have about 30 of them, and this became an attribute. So we started in 2017 um, when, we, we, when we were involved with the Achieving the Dream grant, and that was one of the really great things that came out of that was to do that. And we started um, big conversations around our working groups about what to call it, you know, back to what Nathan was saying, we don't do strictly OER. That's just too difficult to control. Um, so we do zero text, zero cost textbook, ZTC, zero text courses. Um, and we have a process by which um, faculty can market, it, it varies from school to school. Again, we're a very large institution. We have about 500,000 undergraduates and non-degree um, seeking students over the five boroughs of New York City. And we have a very um, needy population in terms of being able to afford textbooks. So it's really a hard project across CUNY and it's gotten a lot of um, adoption. About um, a year into the Achieving the Dream 
program, uh, New York State started supporting this for us. So that became a project in every single school. Um, one of the advantages that we have, and it may be the same at Houston, is that um, we have one registration system for across CUNY. So we can take, we can see what's going on. We can measure it. We can use different metrics for assessment. Um, one of the things that we've seen is since 2017, we have more than 23,000 courses marked in our system, which is pretty awesome. Um, at one point, somebody who was, works in my office was going through things, sort of just taking a look at, you know, um, trends that students do to register for courses. And he found one student who took 12 OER, CTC courses. And so, you know, my thought was, can we find this student? Can we, <laughs> can we ask him, why did he hear? What, why did he hear what others don't necessarily hear? Um, so we market it in the, in the school's projects. We talk to advisors as well. Uh, we do a blast to students and I'm going to share that with you. It's an email blast that goes directly to their email. It's also on Twitter and Facebook and I'm going to try and share. Textbook prices can be astronomical, but the good news is a growing number of courses at CUNY assign cost-free books and materials. They're called Open Educational Resources. They're free, openly licensed, and mean you don't have to spend big bucks on commercial textbooks. Registration is underway, so search now for Zero Textbook Cost Courses. It's easy. Select the Zero Textbook Cost Course attribute and searching for courses in CUNY first. For more information on open educational resources and how New York State is working to make your college education more affordable, go to openness.org. So that gets blasted out every semester during registration time, which is actually about three months before registration, right up until um, school starts. We also have th uh, other um, things that we hand out. We have bookmarks, we have screens for the libraries and for the, for the colleges. We have one pagers. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed on how many shares we have on YouTube. I would, I would have hoped that we'd had more, but we don't. Um, so I, I think, you know, what's happened and the reason there's so much interest in this is that, you know, in the last three years, this has just advanced so quickly, you know, with states jumping in and supporting. I mean, I know at CUNY, it's like, Two years ago, we had to explain ourselves everywhere we went, and now everybody knows what we're talking about and how do we get involved and how do we mark our courses. Um, so it's been pretty successful. Uh, we recently added a low cost um, at CUNY. Uh, there was a feeling that I guess the $40 threshold across the nationwide is too high for us, so we went with 25 for uh, the low cost, and we try to um, consider that. Um, sort of a nod to the OER providers who typically charge that per student. Um, so pretty much um, that's how it's going. Um, we have LTC, we have ZTC, we have, uh, we have actually hired somebody from the Grad Center at CUNY to do some analysis of, of, of what's getting reported in our ZTC. Great, thanks, Anne, and thanks for showing that video. I think it's really helpful to see, you know, the kind of communication that's going out to students. And it also leads us to our next question, I think, that um, Caitlin just posted in the chat. So I'll just pause for a moment to thank our three guests for their stories, and then to invite all of you to either post questions in, your ch in chat, or you're welcome to unmute your microphone if you just want to chat audibly. Um, so Caitlin asks, can you talk more about how you decided to highlight OER specifically in the video when the course marking is just for zero cost? I've been thinking a lot about how to be complete and including library licensed and other affordable materials when marketing, but also how not to be confusing in throwing too many terms out there. Always tough to juggle the terms and the acronyms, and especially once they become sort of invisible to us because we're throwing them around all the time. Yeah, I think there's a real blending of that term OER. In the very beginning, when we were talking about OER, we kind of felt like, well, we don't want to use this terminology because it's going to confuse people. And then it became part of everyday speech. So I think when we refer to OER at this point, we're fairly comfortable referring to it as 
zero textbook cost courses because it is so pervasive throughout the university. So we know we're talking about zero cost materials, and, but the students don't really differentiate. Um, so yeah, you're right. Um, it's a thing to think about. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, you know, sort of scientific at all. I mean, these are 10 case studies that, um, you know, just sort of applied to be part of the book, but I'll, I'll just link to um, kind of our analysis of how they define the different uh, markings. And yeah, I mean, we started the book thinking that it would be, um, you know, all about open materials and quickly found that affordable kept coming up, right? Um, that, that having that kind of, um, having a student easily digest and understand um, was really important. So I think, I think each institution has, you know, takes a, a different approach based on the history of their OER programming and, um, you know, their students' basic familiarity with the issue. And you were talking about the cost threshold too, Anne. I mean, I think it, yeah, it's all so contextual. Nathan, when you were working on your student communication plan with um, the communication team, did you guys sort of have to suss out which terms to use or how to be consistent? Yeah, so <clears throat> what we typically do is say that the, the courses are zero cost books or low cost books courses, and that the way that faculty can achieve that zero cost is by using open mater openly licensed materials. So, you know, yeah, we do, so we mention OER, we just say that's the, that's the way they get there by using, and that seems to be language that people kind of just in, and this is not any kind of, this is anecdotal, but like just when I talk to people, that seems to be something that, that they, they understand, right? Okay, so, oh, how, how can you make the materials free? I say, well, you know, we're using materials that have a certain copyright license that allows you to have free access to them. And then they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, that, um, it was definitely part of the conversation. Um, and um, we, we also allow, I know some people, some Z degree programs have um, a requirement that you use openly licensed materials. We are explicit that you are allowed to use library materials. This is for, on the faculty side. We don't, this isn't necessarily for students, it's in our policies on the Z degree, but you can use, uh, open and free resources on the web, as well as library resources. So um, that may include um, sort of the, the DRM type uh, managed resources that you get like eBooks in the library that are actually copyrighted, but because the institution has a certain license um, agreement, they we are, you know, students can have free access to it. So it's, we definitely are focused on the free more than uh, as much as the open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Jonathan asks if it's true that students preferentially choose ZTC courses when they have a choice and do we have any well-designed studies on this? Well, who wouldn't? Right. <laughs> um, I, I think there's, you know, we're still up against particularly, and uh, you know, Nathan is in an urban environment as well. You know, our students are predominantly commuters. They very notoriously don't read their email. It's really hard to get good communication. That's been our biggest trouble. You know, we work with student affairs as well. We say any time you go to talk to a student group, invite us. We only want five minutes of your time. And every time we've been, we've been really well received because they're like, oh, really? And we say, yeah, tell your friends and tell your friends to tell your friends. But still, communication remains for us to be the biggest obstacle. So I, I think who wouldn't, but they have to know. Sarah, do you know if um, there have been any studies on this? Because I would, I've been very interested in this question and I haven't found anything out there. I've talked to my institutional research folks and we're thinking about how you would design a study that would actually answer that question. We think that you would have to actually look at enrollment over time. So you would actually have to have snapshots of the enrollment counts uh, at certain at certain times, intervals, because um, it's not enough to look at whether the class fills. The question is sort of how quickly is it filling? 
right? So um, this is a, it's a very interesting question. We are doing something where we track student searches in the SS. So when they, when they do that course attribute, it's a, just like what Ann had in the video, we do very similar thing. There's a filter where you can search by course attribute. And um, so we, we track every time a student uh, does that search, we get, I, get a, I can get a printout of that per semester. So I know that there were like a thousand searches that use the filter. And then I can tell what course that person ended up looking at. So we are getting some data on that, but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, this is not something we could find um, when we were writing the assessment section, like trying to find um, studies in the existing literature. And I think a lot of what we have here, I think it, it's very similar to what you're saying, Nathan, you know, good ideas are like brainstorming. Um, so in addition to what you said, even I wonder if it'd be in, like kind of interesting to do um, maybe a focus group or even watching a student use the uh, course catalog, right? And how do they, how are, yeah, how are they searching or, or making decisions? Um, it's almost like usability testing, but for their decision-making process for selecting courses. Um, but I don't know of any existing um, studies related, related to that. And I'm wondering whether any particular findings, if you were able to track down that student who enrolled in 12 courses, were there specific things that the student was looking for or communication blasts that um, really was the tipping point for them? So ethically, we're not really supposed to know this. Okay. <laughs> so no so we, you know, we're sort of putting it on the back burner for now. Go ahead, Jonathan. So, I mean, I, I think it is a hard study to do because, for example, if you, you know, you would want to compare, as people always say, apples to apples, you know, you'd want to have different, um, two different sections of the same course at the same time. So it's not some sort of scheduling issue that is make, that is driving the decision. Then, of course, it's typically, it's associated with a particular faculty or instructor choice, presumably, or, and it might be the younger, more hip faculty are using the OER, and therefore, are you really just finding where the the more popular professors are. So it's, it seems like it's a hard thing to do, but it really is a question we want to be able to answer. I mean, I, we're going to have to implement this on by state law in about a year on my, in my state. I'm in the state of Colorado, and we're thinking about it a lot right now. And my colleagues all say, oh, but you know, they're all going to run to that cheap course rather than the high quality one I give. And I'd like to have, you know, I agree with Anne. I think it's, you know, why wouldn't they choose the cheap one and go good for it, go, you know, good on them. But Nevertheless, we want to, it would be nice to have a really hard number to quote at them. Um, a good study. So just can I, if, if I've got the mic, can I just ask a question? You know, there've been some discussions about like the, what is the definition of low cost and that like in, in the CUNY system and the other system. And I, I, if Nathan said it was pretty easy to see what the costs were and what were zero cost as in, in his discussion of whether it's OER or zero. And he went with cost because that's easy to check. You go to the bookstore, you look at syllabi. That's the thing that's scaring me a little bit, getting accurate information in a timely fashion because you know instructors sometimes change and therefore they change their book. I've put, been put on a class a week before the semester starts. So I, these things can happen at the last minute. And um, so I'm a little bit curious, dubious, well, I don't know, I'm concerned about how easy it is to collect this data. And if you do have the data, has anyone thought about just putting the actual number on the, in the SIS, right? Why not just say, like have a little field that says required texts for this book are $179 at the bookstore. And students can think, oh, I can probably get it from half price books for $100. Um, but why would, why would we bother giving a detailed thing about, um, making a decision about what the low is, low cost is, when we can give the actual number. So for low, um, we, you know, I kind of feel like we gave, we did the low cost because uh, an English teacher who assigns two novels that cost $15 feels excluded. And so we're kind of giving a nod to say, okay, we're gonna include you in this initiative that we're doing and you can feel part of it and you can advertise yourself to your students this way. So we, so that's why we started with the low and we just sort of had to pick a number for the low. You know, we could, you know, I think by adding the low versus an actual number, it gives you, we know, okay, it's less than $25. That's what our low cost is. 
Um, also, you know, what we found happening is uh, big departments, math departments, for example, were using um, my open math, for example, and entire departments changed over to my open math and they were entirely ZTC courses. And then a company came in and said, convinced them that they need to be using OHM, which cost $25 per student. And we were like, what, wait, no, what? But we don't have control over that. So we didn't want to exclude them at that point. We wanted to still include them because they were part of the initiative and they did um, spend their time and effort to, you know, convert these courses, but, you know, you get sidelined by these things. So I think, you know, it is important to have a, a low cost as a comparative thing, although across the country, there are very widely varying ideas of what that is. Um, I, I wanted to kind of pick up a question that came up. Some people were saying that how hard it is to track this stuff and I sent John's question as well. Like, I'll say what I do um, at HCC and it's pretty time intensive. So I mean, I'm not, um, you know, I think you need to have somebody who can devote a little time to this every year. But basically, um, because I have the historical data on right, who has been teaching these courses, I have a running list of faculty who basically I know have been using these courses. We did a uh, we did a research study um, uh, a couple of years ago, and it's about to be published uh, in Frontiers in Education. And they have, and we, as part of that research study, I physically went through all the syllabi and made and confirmed that everything that we had tagged as zero cost books was zero cost books. So I feel like I have a very good baseline for who are the faculty who've been using that. So that means every semester, as the semester approaches, I pull from the student information system um, a document that has every course that's been tagged as zero cost books. And then I look at the instructor list and just check to see if there are any names on there that I don't recognize. If I don't recognize them, I email the chair and the instructor just to verify that they're in fact using that material. Uh, I can do another thing, whereas if I see an instructor that's dropped off, like they always use zero cost books and they're not tagged. Then I also go back and say, well, is there a reason why what happened there? Um, that's pretty labor intensive. The thing that's really hard is that once you tag us, see you're tagging sections, but as we all know, anybody who's managed a department at a college or university, especially a community college like Ann and I, you uh, staffing, changes rapidly at the very end of the uh, enrollment period, right before the semester starts. And um, because of just things that happen. And so the course might be tagged zero cost, but then you switched instructors, you know, is that instructor still using uh, the material? So what you basically have to do is really work with the chairs the, or whoever's handling the staffing and the tagging and make sure they understand the issues that surround, you know, the tagging, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. And then hopefully they, you know, the faculty and the chairs together can self-monitor. Um, and I think that's the best case scenario. Um, and it just, it just takes a lot of work. Yeah, I would say that there is a big mess that develops out of all of this, you know, all of these factors that come in like courses, you know, carrying over and that sort of thing. You know, we found a situation where uh, we work with Academos Bookstore <clears throat> and they, they were very cooperative with us and they put a button on there uh, when a faculty member goes in and puts their courses in their, you know, their requests, they're supposed to do it whether or not they're uh, asking for books for the bookstore from the bookstore. So they can just tag their courses OER and it automatically converts in our registration system. So we know right away then. And then we found that Instructors were doing that. They would tag, they would mark a course as OER. And then in the notes, they would require texts. And we were like, wait, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so that was pretty crazy. Um, so I, you know, that says to me that they, it was desirable that for them to be perceived as a ZTC course. But, and I don't, you know, we have so many instructors. It's just, it's, it's really hard to keep a handle on sometimes. 
Definitely. And there's a question from Kristen. So Kristen, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, no, no camera today, so I uh, apologize. Um, I think that that um, sort of desirability to be in the cohort of classes that is marked as um, no or low cost or affordable or whatever the um, terms are is truly um, something that faculty should aspire to. And so we've um, at UWM just gotten started with our project and really kept um, kept the, the group of classes that qualifies for this um, attribute in the course leaf system that we use. We've kept that to a really close group. Um, but we have done the work of saying that courses that are $25 and less could also be included there. Um, I really appreciate the um, comment that, you know, sometimes faculty don't know what they're going to be teaching, especially when we're dealing with large numbers of adjuncts, especially when we're dealing with a year like we've just had um, of trying to prepare under um, sort of unknown circumstances. So what we have done is um, we've added the attribute to the course, but um, we've also put in a note that says, check the bookstore for your specific section. So if we offer 22 sections of English 101 and we have one person who only teaches that class every four years, um, then that person may not be part of the affordable cohort or they may not be part of the um, open cohort for that textbook. So what we wanna do is make sure that the transparency is there for the students it, that they're able to filter for the affordable marking, but then um, it kind of takes us off the hook, so to speak, that you know students still need to check which section with the bookstore. So the bookstore is fulfilling their role of um, noting the cost of course materials um, for financial aid purposes and administrative purposes. But then we're still offering students that opportunity to try to identify um, open and affordable courses through the course schedule. At some point, we'd really, really like to be able to get to the section level. But since we're doing everything manually right now, we don't have that workflow built. And since we're pretty small right now, I think that's okay because it's kind of allowing us to see, you know, what some of the the challenges are. But as soon as we went live with this, we had faculty contacting us and say, hey, uh, my book is $24.99. <laughs> Can I be included? Um, but um, you know, for the sake of the registrar and Lord knows they've had enough to deal with, with converting the status of classes and that sort of thing. Um, but, um, you know, we're just trying to, to get started on the project, but I think um, what we're really interested ultimately is, is coming up with better workflows to, um, to make things more seamless as we grow with it. Thanks, Kristen. It's, Great to hear um, another case study of what's being done in Wisconsin. Um, and good to hear your voice, it's been a while. So um, thanks everyone for a great discussion and uh, I will uh, continue to invite you to post your questions or comments in the chat or if you wanna in unmute, feel free to jump into the conversation um, when you can, it's not too formal here. Um, one, one thing that Sarah, you talked about that I thought maybe we could revisit because it's popped up a couple times as an aside is that in the guide, um, there is some discussion about how to handle common faculty concerns and how to have those conversations and talk with them when this is introduced. And so I was wondering if you or anyone in the call um, could talk a little bit more about tactics for that. Yeah, let me go ahead and drop this in here. So we really, you know, it's hard to be exhaustive, um, of course, with every concern that might come up or things that might 
be effective even, right? It, it depends so much on groups, on a specific group. And so what we tried to do instead was give sort of a framework, um, you know, here's here are things that you might try uh, based on that group. So for example, we talk a little bit about util utilizing strategic documents that talk about, you know, the institution's mission and kind of pointing to access and affordability, student agency, transparency, you know, some of those things that um, we see course marking kind of overlapping with trying to use data when possible. Um, and then here at the very bottom, we talk a little bit about concerns. Um, so yeah, the second one there, you know, commonly concerned about um, maybe enrollment changing based on the markings. Um, and so we we try to give a couple ideas really, but again, it's it's based on your sort of um, context, you know, how you kind of apply these. Um, but yeah, I'd welcome any discussion on some of these um, more in depth points. You know, one is administrators talking about the cost of such an initiative, right? Like there's maybe extra technical costs, there's more work on the registrar, there's assessment costs. Um, yeah. The faculty concerns, um, you know, just misconceptions um, about what this might do with uh, student enrollment and interest. Um, yeah, so we kind of try and give a couple couple of ideas, but the folks that have actually implemented it, I don't know if you you all have that stuff to add. I I mean, this is like I would I would say there's two different concerns. There's one is the administration level, like you said, Sarah, there's this, um, and there are concerns. I mean, you'll hear certain things like, um, well, if we use more open materials, you know, are we going to lose revenue from the bookstore? Because, you know, as the bookstore diminishes revenue, usually they have an arrangement where they, some of that comes back to the college or university. Um, so there are concerns about that. I will, um, there's concerns about, yeah, administrative costs in terms of maintaining the program, um, you know, and, and then there's also questions about, well, what are the real benefits here, right? You know, um, are, are faculty just going without a textbook here? You know, what's, what's this? Um, so there's, there are definitely lots of concerns. I, I think on the administrative side, the best thing to do is to sort of track some data and try to report that course that takes work but there there's lots of good stuff out there so one thing I'll point people to is um, Anne was mentioning she was part of that achieving the dream group uh, the OER degree plan they have published a series of, of um, research book, um, white papers essentially that um, that look at the impacts of those degree programs the most recent one which was published in January I think of this year uh, is really good. It looks at the economics specifically and finds that, in fact, uh, it looks like these OER programs actually bring in more money to the institution by increased enrollment intensity. So there's um, so there's an argument to be made there. Um, then when you go to the faculty side, you know I think the concerns about you know are students going to flock to those courses. These are things I've heard. What I would just say is like you know what I, I was department chair for three years. I've been tracking this stuff for a while. What I see is students flock to instructors, bottom line. So, you know, if they, if you have, if you, if your courses fill up, they're going to continue to fill up. Students want instructors. That's what they want. So um, that's what I see. But, you know, I, that's, again, that's pretty soft data. But yeah, I'll get you. I'll get you, John. Um, I, I just want to make one comment about, um, <clears throat> what's happened at CUNY in terms of um, OER and how it's blossomed into this whole open pedagogy movement. So, you know, we say, come for the OER, stay for the open pedagogy. So it's much more than just, I mean, it's surely about saving students money, enabling them to stay in school, to progress more quickly through school and not fail and all of those things. But it's really, really very strongly at CUNY and probably elsewhere too. I mean, I can't, I can't see avoiding having it become such an enlightenment tool for instructors. You know, when they go to these professional development workshops, they're like, they come out and they like say, I mean, my mind is blown, you know what were we thinking about textbooks? So it's really, it's so intertwined now. So, you know, and of course, you know, instructors who are um, 
open to new um, pedagogies and things are probably better instructors. They're probably more concerned about their students. They're not just maintaining their job for whatever reason. Um, so the, 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 these things have all become entwined. You know, this past year, for example, the theme of every single thing we've ever done, um, professional development is open pedagogy and OER. And this year, particularly in this COVID moment, we have been able, you know, we have more all sorts of professional development opportunities that never occurred before via central office that we as OER people have been heavily involved with. So, you know, I think at some point we have to bring in that open pedagogy piece because that's all about the philosophy of developing your course. And yes, of course, you know, it, it is about saving students money, but there's so much more to it. I mean, look at the conferences. It's all, you know, so I just want to throw that in there. I want to just add to some of the benefits that we talk about that might be, you know, talking points for administrators and faculty alike. I mean, what Nathan said about there's a variety of reasons a student chooses a course we don't quite understand. Uh, sometimes it's a pretty complex decision making process. And then also, you know, for better or worse, course markings can also be used in, um, uh, you know, kind of trying to attract new students, talking about the institution as a whole, trying to increase access and make um, their education more affordable. So thinking about that in recruitment materials and also, you know, when working with donors or, you know, other folks that might be interested in supporting the institution in some way. And then the other piece is like thinking about how an OER or affordable course material initiative feeds course marking and vice versa. So like the idea that maybe starting a course marking initiative might, um, you know, result in instructors being more, again, we don't have hard data on this, but, you know, being more likely to adopt and then vice versa, making that more uh, visible as, um, you know, kind of an important step for raising awareness about the work you're already doing. So I think that all of those things are kind of intangible in some way, but might be ways to present some of the benefits. Thanks, Sarah. And you were sort of alluding to one of hopefully the final questions we'll have for today. I'm going to do a last call for folks in the chat. If you had anything more to ask, please feel free to drop that in. Um, but for someone who is on the call right now thinking of starting this kind of marking system or initiative, um, where would you recommend that they begin? We've talked about a lot of different stakeholders, um, whether it's folks in the libraries, in the advising office, or talking to students themselves. For someone who's been listening on this call and uh, taking a moment that says, oh no, this sounds like a lot of work, where do I start? What would you encourage them to do? And Anne and Nathan, you've seen these initiatives grow significantly over the past few years. So looking back to when you began, how would you suggest someone um, start doing this work? Get a group together, get library representation, get CEDL's representation, get as many chairs as you can, talk to your administrators. Um, you know, we are very um, careful about not top down, even though we're kind of like, we're sitting in central office, so it could be perceived that we are telling people what to do. And we're very careful about not telling people what to do. But there's been such overwhelmingly heartfelt interest from the campuses and each one um, operates in their own fashion very different from one another uh, and to embrace that and just you know whatever their style whatever style works for you it works for us kind of thing <laughs> um, but yeah it started with a group i mean we had a little tiny work group five years ago and look where we are today it's crazy just crazy and but those were great voices on campus you know they were they were um, proud librarians and proud people from CEDLs we have I would say 80% more almost 90% of our uh, campus leads are in in the library um, so your librarians are your friends for sure we definitely love our librarians in this community here um, Nathan you had an excellent suggestion in the chat about also thinking about your strategic plan did you want to elaborate on that yeah, that's something that I'm actively doing this uh, this year and um, trying to outline objectives. And what I'm actually, big thing that I'm doing right now is trying to get our key performance indicators sort of set up so that they are 
we have a regular report on that and it, everybody's sort of on the same page with this is what we're measuring, this is how we're gonna assess this program. Because what has happened, I do an annual report to the Board of Trustees, but it seems like every year I'll present what I've got and then I'll get like the chancellor and the, the chief academic officer, you know, going, oh, I, these aren't the best numbers. Can you do something different? And it's like, uh, look, can we just agree on what we're measuring? And <laughs> like, I can present it every year. But so we're trying to align that and get it settled. Um, I, to answer the question about getting started, I think Anne's exactly right. Build a coalition of allies. Some people specifically for course marking, though, you are going to need to get um, a senior level IT administrator who is in charge of your student information system. Um, and you're going to need to have at least a senior, as, as senior a person in your um, academic instruction unit to be there too, uh, so they can, uh, you know, uh, put the muscle behind the, the request um, because it's difficult. They're going to, it's going to require, I mean, in, in PeopleSoft, the course attribute field is like, you can just add a new course attribute. So it's pretty simple. Then getting that course attribute embedded into the um, search is a little more difficult, but we didn't, it didn't require the creation of anything brand new within the system for us. Um, that may be different for you. So it may require some coding and that they're going to, they're going to resist doing that stuff. But, you know, this is where state mandates actually come in handy. So hopefully, you know, in Colorado, I know Texas has that. So, um, you know, you can use some legislation as a, a kind of a, a stick as well. So we actually paid somebody um, to work in the registrar's office part time to help us with this because we didn't want to burden them. Um, and it does definitely require um, they, they have to work with you or else it's never going to happen. And I can't believe, Nathan, that you have this PeopleSoft system too, which people quit at CUNY over. But for us, it's been such a boon because we can see everything. Like we're the only people who ever said this is great, you know, <laughs> ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, our PeopleSoft is universally loathed, but you know, <laughs> sometimes it works. And Sarah, do you happen to know from um, the other folks who were contributing case studies whether anyone has used a different SIS system? So Jonathan is wondering about Banner. Yes, so KPU looks like is Banner. Um, again, that, I think that's the institution that Rajiv is at. And that's all I see for our 10 or so case studies. Oh, sorry, I'm just copying links and text constantly. I <laughs> hope that's helpful. But this chart does give like each SIS. So if you wanted to see, like, yeah, I don't have great recommendations for first step, but that, what something I would do is look to see who's using um, a similar SIS or, you know, is a similar sized institution and reach out to them and talk to them about their process too. So, you know, hopefully the resource could provide some leads there. I think some of the SUNY schools use Banner and they were marking with Banner. Um, if anybody wants a contact there, I can help you. Okay, well, what a great question to end on. Um, I hope that everyone who's here is coming away with something they can apply at their institution. Um, I know there was a lot of great information shared. Please join me in thanking our three guests today, Sarah Hare, scholarly communication librarian at Indiana University in Bloomington, sharing lots of links and helpful information in the chat. Uh, Nathan Smith, instructor or your coordinator at Houston Community College and Ann Fiddler, open education librarian at City University of New York. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and your stories and recommendations. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone who attended. So uh, Aperva put a, a link in the chat earlier. If you would like to see future topics, future guests, uh, please let us know. We invite your recommendations and ideas. And uh, I'll turn things over to Aperva for our, for our farewell. Well, thank you, first of all, to our guests. This was a fantastic session. This was an entirely new topic to me, so I've definitely learned a lot. And I can see from the chat that um, people have taken away uh, lots of different things, whether they're talking to um, their faculty, their students, or their IT folks to implement this themselves. Um, 
nothing else on our and we really look forward to hearing um, from all of you the community about future topics that you'd like us to discuss um, maybe we even see some new faces on the call here um, and I will leave you all with that thank you again and have a good rest of the week bye everybody Hello. thank you